Okay, chapter 11. When Rehoboam returned to Jerusalem, he assembled the house of Judah and Benjamin, and there you go, there, an example of the two, right? Or of them. But inside of Judah is also Simeon. Where do we see Simeon later in the Bible, like in the New Testament? Are there, are there little elements of that kind of scattered around like crumbs? Simon, the name Simon. That's the family name Simeon. And so some people are named Simon here and there um, around. And, and to me, that's, that's kind of the remnant of the tribe of Simeon. Of, of what's left over. And the, the, the one thing that the tribe of Simeon always had responsibility for was the well of Beersheba in the south. That was, no, there is no question, that was Simeon, Beersheba. Some of the cities around there, is it Judah, is it Simeon, is it whatever, but that was, that was, uh, that was Simeon. Okay, so 180,000 specially chosen Soldiers, we would call these what elite troops, I suppose, something like that, to wage war against Israel in order to restore the kingdom of Rehoboam. What American war is this? This is the civil war now. This is you're in rebellion. I'm not going to let you rebel. I want you back. What did Lincoln say? Lincoln quoted a proverb. Cannot stand. Yeah, proverb. He quoted Jesus said, who said that actually. Yeah, yeah. Was it always certain that the North was going to win the Civil War? No. Came close early in the war to losing catastrophically. Um, the longer the war lasted, the, the, the odds of the North winning started to go way, way up. But early on, at first Manassas, for example, Bull Run, um, uh, shortly after that, if, if the South had demanded terms, had gotten away with some of the demands that they, they, they had planned to make, the one, are you aware of, the, of, the, of what they were going to do at Gettysburg? They were, at Gettysburg, the, the South was, be, the Gettysburg campaign, the South was between Gettysburg and Washington. The south, uh, the, the north was, you know, in the, in the wrong position there. And the Confederacy was going to give Lincoln a letter uh, giving him terms after they had won at Gettysburg. And basically because Chamberlain, uh, Colonel uh, Chamberlain won the Battle of Little Round Top just by the skin of his teeth. He had no bullets left, right? Do you know the story? He told his troops to fix bayonets, and they swung down uh, in, a, in a bayonet charge. And against, I think that they were from uh, Alabama troops coming up the hill, that that was the turn of the battle, the turn of the tide, probably the moment that saved the war. Um, and, uh, 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 and that's, you know, 63. The war went on for two years after that. But from that point onward, um, the North... As, as uh, Shelby Foote said about the Civil War, the, the Union fought that war with one hand behind its back. You know, if they needed to, we would just have brought the, I say we because my family was from the North, but we would have brought the other hand out from around the back. The longer the war went on, the better the odds were in the Civil War. Um, that's, that's rarely the case. Usually it's right up to the wire, you know, but okay. Let's go, let's go back to our text here. Otherwise, I'm just going to lecture about the Civil War, and you don't want to hear me do that. <clears throat> the word of the Lord came, but the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God. Another one of these uh, prophets we don't know a lot about here at this time. Say the following to Rehoboam, son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel and Judah and Benjamin, this is what the Lord says. Do not attack and do not fight against your brother Israelites. Go home, every one of you, for this turn of events is from me. So God had used this um, to punish Israel, and he didn't want to do it in Solomon's lifetime. Why? Because what you do to the son reflects on the father. So Solomon was spared this. 
Was it for Solomon's sake? No, it's for David's sake. But er, like, like, like I said at the beginning of the last, of the last uh, half hour, um, it seems like this, the, the tearing of the kingdom happens about midway through Solomon's reign already, about the time he was building the terraces and the millow, and, uh, and then Jeroboam just ran away to Egypt for a while under Pharaoh Shishak but, uh, and hides there until, until Solomon's dead. But now God says, no, let this happen, north and south. And God tells Jeroboam, if you're faithful to me, I will bless you and you will cause Judah to turn. Because he'll see, the Judah will see how I've blessed you in the north. As long as you're faithful to me, I will continue to bless you. So God dividing the kingdom, who will be faithful to me? Of course, what was the answer? Kind of, sort of, neither one. But not as well, because we're all sinful. Um, they listen to the words of the Lord and refrain from going against Jeroboam. So the war doesn't happen. 180,000 hand-picked, trained troops, and they just go home. So the war doesn't take place. However, Rehoboam does decide to build cities for, uh, for defending um, Judah. And he does it, this is interesting as we see the map uh, unfold. He does it uh, not just from one front. He rebuilds the interior cities, the border cities, the fortified cities. He builds everywhere. What American president did that. Fortified the interior. He invented the interstate system. Eisenhower. Ike was Eisenhower. Yeah. Why did Eisenhower do that? Because Eisenhower had traipsed on foot through Sicily, which had no roads, and Italy, which had goat paths, and, and, and Germany that had cobblestone lanes and Eisenhower knew we need better roads than this. That, that's, that's, that, that was, no, that's not a myth. It was a part of the original plan. It's no longer required by law, but it was required that every third mile of interstate had to be a straightaway in order to serve as an emergency landing field. Like for that could land a C-130. Um, and that, in the original plan of the interstate, Every third mile would be straight. So you get these curves and you get these long straightaways, then curves again and then long straightaways and so forth. And was behind the decision making of which state or county highways are going to get converted into interstate because the interstate did a lot of conscripting, you know, in those days. Um, so, all right, Rehoboam builds cities. Let's take a look at what they are. They're not going to mean to you as they, I'm just reading them, but I'm going to read verse five here. Rehoboam resided in Jerusalem. He built cities for defense in Judah. How long has, here's a historical question for you. How long had Jerusalem been the capital city? Let's assume that this is the first year of Jeroboam's reign. Who, who conquered Jerusalem in his seventh year? David. Yeah, but they didn't, it wasn't the capital of it wasn't the capital of Israel, it was Melchizedek's house. It was a Jebusite city. So 40 years of Solomon, 33 years of David, 73 years is how long they had. Jerusalem had been the capital city. Okay, that's how long it's been. And now, and now Rehoboam will be the third king to set up a house in Jerusalem. And he built cities for defense in Judah. He built, and now if you just look at the map, I'll walk you through them in the order that we have them in the text. So I'm going to, they'll have red dots. Okay, so can you, can you see that one good enough? Yes. That's what they're going to look like or, or bigger. So Bethlehem and then a village called Etam, Tekoa. Tekoa famous, anybody know what prophet came from Tekoa? Amos. Amos. He was a shepherd, probably raised lambs for Passover. That's part of what he did. And then after Tekoa, now, now that's a, that's a, those three are kind of in a cluster, right? And this list gives them to us in little clusters like it's the next one down the road in, in many of these cases. Then we go to Beth Zur, which is over here. 
And then a place called Soho, which is way on the bottom. And then Adullam, which is way up there. And it's curious that these three are the next group, but they may have been the, the, the danger spots, the hot spots at this time um, because of the remnant of Philista, of Philistia or something like that. But now we go to Gath. And what do you think of when you think of Gath? Goliath. Goliath. This is the other Gath. This is Morasheth Gath. And Morasheth is the hometown of the prophet Micah. Okay, so this is Gath up in Judah. It's not, and by the way, Gath or Gut simply means olive press. So that there, there are a bunch of these places, but this one is the one at, at Morasheth. Um, in fact, there's a Gath right near Jerusalem, isn't there? Gethsemane. That's, that's Gethsemane, the Garden of Gethsemane, the olive press there. Okay, so Adullam and Morasheth, and then a little place called Ziph. This is back down in, oh, Marisha, by the way. Mara, Gath and Marasha are together in the list, but then there's a Morasheth Gath and then a Marasha. Are they two different towns near each other? Maybe, I'm not sure about that. And then we go down, down to Ziph, and then we get back to this of, uh, of having places in line or on the same road. Across the valley from Ziph is a place called um, Adorayim. And then Lachish or Lachish, famous uh, because along with Azekah, which is the next one. Do you see those two? I'll do them again. Lachish and Azekah. In the prophet Jeremiah, those are the last three fortified cities in Judah as, um, as the uh, uh, Babylonians are coming. Um, and then the, 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 uh, the guy, and then in, 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 it's called the Lachish letters. There are these pottery shards that served as letters between the garrison commander at Lachish and his, his boss in Jerusalem. He says, I can see your signal fires at night in Jerusalem. And he says, but I can no longer see Azekah. That's Lachish letter number four. It just sends a chill down my spine because that's that historical moment when it fell, when they went from three cities to two in Judah as, as things were ending um, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the south there. That's a long way from here, though. And then we have Zora, place called Ijalon, way up north, and then finally Hebron, uh, which I have the, I have, uh, I, this is Gibeon I have circled here. Hebron would be down um, probably between Tekoa and Beth Sur. I realized that this morning that I had put the dot in the wrong place because I did all the dots um, last night at, at, at school on, in, my, uh, in my study. So I have that last dot wrong, I'm sorry. But then it, uh, we're told he built up all of their fortifications. So do you see how he kind of takes care of the whole interior of uh, of, of uh, Judah especially. And what, what's kind of left off of here is this, none of this is Benjamin. This is all Judah. Benjamin is north of Jerusalem. So on the map, it would be Nob, Anatoth, Geba, Michmash, Ramah. That's Benjamin. So he doesn't worry about that. And why? Well, maybe the Benjamin cities were already pretty well fortified. He didn't have to. Um, but he worries about, about Judah first, anyway. Built up their fortifications. This is an example of what one of these looks like. Um, so the, the road on the right, there's a kind of a dirt road. That's an archaeological access road. That is not the, the edge of the city. You see the, the, the way the city probably went by looking at the right hand and how big that wall was. That's simply the, the, the archaeological dig. This happens to be the city we talked about earlier, Shechem. I want to show you something here about this map. If the thing doesn't get too big, do you see under the word fortifications, there's a great big thing there, really well, uh, nicely intact and so forth. Um, that seems to be a palace across the street from it. This um, picture doesn't have the the image yet, um, but at uh, uh, there, there is a small 
um, what looks like a shrine that's pretty well intact. And uh, we're going to see pictures of another one they found at, at Dan, way, way up north, that actually looks like a duplicate of Solomon's temple. Maybe a little bit smaller, probably Jeroboam's shrine or high place up at Dan. He built it to look like Solomon's temple. He placed commanders in them. These are those fortified cities. And stores of food, oil, and wine. Why mention oil here? Oil it was everything. Oil was, yeah, um, I mean, you, you burn it for, for heat and for light and for cooking. You use it for cooking, not only as a condiment, but to mix with everything. Um, you use oil for other things as well, including as a medicine, both externally and internally. You drank oil to heal. You put oil on the outside to heal. There are some people who claim that the Bible doesn't have any medicine in it. There's lots of medicine in the Bible. Um, and oil was a big part of a lot of it. Not all of it, though. Um, in fact, our, 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 our Lutheran dogmaticians, uh, what's the first example of, of, uh, of medicine or surgery in Scripture? It's Adam and Eve. It's the rib coming out of Adam. Yeah. However, whatever procedure God used... He removed a rib from Adam physically. Um, and the dogmaticians list that as the very first example of, of medicine. And, I mean, did God do a lot of things before man did for man? You know, in fact, in the same chapter, how does that chapter end? What does God make for Adam and Eve after they sin? Outfits, yeah. Something better than leaves. Yeah, so... In each and every city, he placed shields and spears and made the cities very strong. Judah and Benjamin belonged to him. Shields and spears. That's basically their, their, uh, their weapon of choice at this time. What's the advantage of a spear? Longer than a sword, yeah. These weren't javelins, these were spears. These are things that you, you, um, you know, if you get a bunch of guys to hold spears together all in one place, it kind of looks like a hedgehog. And you, you just, you, you're less inclined to run against it. You know, um, you, ju you just are. And shields, um, shields had a couple of uses. One is they're pretty useful if somebody else has a spear or a sword. But you also, shields are, are, are helpful if they've got arrows. What if they have flaming arrows? And they sometimes did. Well, Homer tells us, do you know? You can put it out if it's covered with skin and you all... Well, leather... Well, it, before the battle, though, they would usually soak them. So the leather is wet. That's why they did that. They, they would put leather over the top of it so that it would be wet. And then when the flame arrow hits it, it would extinguish the arrow um, quite often. But there, that's, that's a line in Homer. But Homer, about 800 B.C., is only about 100 years after this. So we're getting to be contemporaries here with uh, some classical authors. Okay. Now, the faithful priests and people come to Rehoboam. I think we have enough time to cover these last two sections. The priests and Levites who were living in Israel, so you understand, they were up north, these Levites and priests. They left the land allotted to them and took their stand with Rehoboam. So I already mentioned that Jeroboam, the northern king, has rejected the theology of the South. So you priests, you Levites, I don't want to listen to you anymore. And we learn in Kings that he began to ordain, quote, anyone who wanted to be a priest. Jeroboam let anybody become a priest who wanted to. Who does that sound like today? A lot of other churches. A lot of church bodies. Whoever wants to be a minister can be a minister. Um, I've known of, of, of ministers of one denomination who were in the parish serving three weeks after saying, I wonder if I'd like to be a pastor. And now three weeks later, they are, a, do they have any training at all? Possibly no training whatsoever. Is that who you want leading your church? Well, unfortunately... Some denominations are so theologically poor that there is nobody else to lead the church. You know, 
What a, what a poverty that is. What a, what a, what a, what a desert that is of, of leadership. I mean, you don't necessarily have to have the eight years of training that we get minimum, but to have none at all, that's, it's, it's, it's a shock. It really is a shock. So the Levites left their pasture lands and their holdings. They came to Judah and Jerusalem because Jeremoam and his sons had removed them from their ministry as priests of the Lord. Now, what were their holdings up north? Well, in the books of Deuteronomy and especially Joshua, there's a lot of uh, 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 text in, in, in Joshua that to some people it's kind of boring, but it tells you like who got what towns and so forth. And those lists, if you don't have a map, those lists are just meaningless. But for, for many people, if you don't have any kind of a mental map of it. But let's take an example of what this would have looked like for one village, okay? Just, I'm going to pick one in Galilee. I just picked one at random, but it, do you recognize the Sea of Galilee there? This is a Google map from last year. This is what it looks like. So let's zoom in on that spot, okay? And what Deuteronomy uh, uh, tells us is that uh, for 3,000 feet outside the city limits, so 3,000 feet is that much. Can you see the little marker I just moved? Outside of the city wall, they got 3,000 feet, and that was pasture land. So they could put up rocks or maybe a fence out there. And then they measured to the south and the west and the north. And that, that whatever territory they were in, this was the pasture land of the Levites who lived in that city. So it was set aside specifically for them. And there were, there were towns like this in every tribe. Some of the towns you would recognize if I said they were, they were also cities of refuge. So the cities of refuge were generally Levitical towns also, but there were other villages besides the cities of refuge. Um, this one's not far from Nazareth, actually. It's in between Nazareth and, uh, the, and Mount Tabor, probably where the, uh, some people think the ascension happened and so forth, but um, if it wasn't at the Mount of Olives, um, there's some people question about that. that I, it's not really our purpose right now, but this is uh, that territory. That's a lot of grazing land. You know, for what I would, I guess, is, what, dozens of Levites or a hundred? You know, but something like that in this village. Well, th their, their income was supposed to come from the temple, actually, but they, but they, had, uh, but they took care of some of their income here by allowing their own animals to graze and so forth. All right. Jeroboam had appointed his own priests for the high places and for the goats and calves he had made. So yeah, we're told Jeroboam made a golden calf and put it in the old shrine at Shiloh. No, I'm sorry, at Bethel. At Bethel. That's where Jacob had uh, seen the vision. And then way up, Bethel was not that far north of, of Jerusalem. And then way up north in Dan, remember I had Lake Hule on the map the last half hour. Um, way up there is Dan and at Tel Dan or the hill of Dan, another shrine. And it seems as if this was looking at the shrine because of the way the archaeology has been panning out. We don't have any reference of this in scripture, but then they're, they're doing a dig and this is what they find. What does that remind you of? There's an altar, steps, pillars, a door, and a high place. This is the temple they've uncovered at Tel Dan. It seemed, and by the way, this is it. They've covered it now from the elements and the sun to kind of preserve it. And this is from a couple years ago, but this, it, it seems to be a duplicate of the actual temple in Jerusalem. Maybe a little bit smaller but so what Jeroboam was building was an imitation of what Solomon had built. So if Jeroboam can say, here is your temple, O Israel, a lot of Israelites might think, well, that's nice. Okay. You know, and, but if the Levite, but he, we, we just saw, but if the Levites aren't there to say, no, it isn't, and there are Jeroboam priests who are saying, yes, it is, then he's eliminated the competition 
and his lie can just get promulgated by, by, uh, by his minions there, the anyone and everyone who wanted to be a priest. You didn't have to be a Levite. You didn't have to, uh, evidently, you didn't have to be a Jew or an Israelite. You just, anybody who wanted to. The priesthood had been males only. Now, could there be females as well? This is on my desk. This was a gift from my friend, Pastor Scharf. <laughs> Inside of this globe lives a fragment of that. This is probably the lip of a, of a, of a bowl. You know, some, some, some bowl that somebody used. Um, but, it, but it's from the correct date and uh, you can, you know, the color is very similar to what's on the screen and so forth. But he brought back several fragments from several places. This one is actually from Tel Dan from this place. And I, I keep this on my desk. Couple verses yet. Oh, we got to get to his favorite wife. Let's uh, keep going here. From all the tribes of Israel, those people who set their hearts on seeking the Lord, the God of Israel, followed the priests and Levites and came to Jerusalem to sacrifice to the Lord, the God of their fathers. There is a kind of an exodus out of the north as people who are faithful come down. Uh, they left. They strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, son of Solomon, secure for three years because for those three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. What does, what does three years also include? Well, I mean, what follows it? Not so faithful? Yeah, there's a, there was an end to that three years. Now, just briefly, there aren't very many verses left here, but the family, I think there's uh, 18 to 23 here, the family of Rehoboam. Rehoboam took as his wife Mahalath. How would you like a daughter-in-law named Mahalath? Would you call her May? Something, Molly, maybe? Who was daughter of David's son, Jeremoth. And of Abihail, the daughter of Jesse's son, Eliab. I think here we have not daughters, but granddaughters. And the same word might get used, but probably granddaughters. She gave birth to these sons for him, Jeush, Shemariah, and Zaham. Do you recognize any of them as later kings of Judah? Me neither, because they weren't. Because in addition to Mahalath, he took Maaka. Oh, look at her. I'm just, that's, that's probably, it's not really her, by the way. Um, the granddaughter of Absalom. So in the line, right? She gave birth to, for him to Abijah, Attai, Ziza, and, um, um, and Shelemith. Do you recognize any of them as future? I do. Abijah, the first one, yeah. In addition to her, uh, oh, there, 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 Abijah. Now, Rehoboam loved Maacah, the granddaughter of Absalom, more than any of his other wives and concubines. So she got special place. That also tells us why her son becomes king. He favored his mom. He favors her son. He took 18 wives and 60 concubines and fathered 28 sons and 60 daughters. That's not really the actual group picture, by the way. But it's just... <laughs> That's 30 Helens is what that is. Rehoboam appointed Abijah, the son of Maacah, as crown prince among his brothers because he was going to make him king. Rehoboam acted wisely and dispersed his sons throughout all the areas of Judah and Benjamin in all the fortified cities. He provided them with abundant provisions and obtained many wives for them. You know, getting your kids out of the palace, that's what David forgot to do. You know, uh, I, I don't know if Solomon did it or not, but I think here Rehoboam shows some wisdom. He at least learned from David's mistakes. If the, if the boys are locked up in the back room in the, in the, in the, in the, in the palace, they're never going to get into trouble and shenanigans back there, right? Um, but if they're out administering, if they're out with responsibility, 
if they, if they have to go to work every day, you know, then they're going to learn something, they're going to be responsible for something, and no two of them are going to conspire against me. So I think that was wise. And there will be a smooth transition from Rehoboam to Abijah. But first, some stuff has to happen to Rehoboam. And uh, next time, we will visit, or we will we'll be visited by Pharaoh Shishak, um, who figures so prominently in Indiana Jones and Raiders of the Lost Ark. So we're, we're coming to that as well. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Wall, Minnesota.